Item number, SCP-1360. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-1360 is to be restrained within a humanoid containment cell at Site-19. The presence of four security personnel is required prior to entry. Restraints may not be removed unless specifically required for testing. For communication purposes, SCP-1360 is to be provided with a pen and notebook. Description: SCP-1360 is an animate, fully articulated android. SCP-1360 stands at 1.83 meters tall and weighs 100 kilograms. Two white PMMA circles, approximately 3 centimeters in diameter, represent the android's eyes. SCP-1360's body is composed of molded polycarbonate casings over an aluminum frame. These casings are covered in a black fabric of unknown composition, referred to as SCP-1360-1. This covering acts as a skin and has a universal thickness of 1 centimeter. The serial number 031 is woven into SCP-1360's left arm in a red variant of SCP-1360-1. Testing to identify SCP-1360-1 has so far met with limited success. The material is a type of aramid fiber with a tensile strength of approximately 4,000 MPa, along with a gravity of 1.1, making the material lighter and stronger than Kevlar. The material is self-repairing, with adjacent damaged SCP-1360-1 fibers reweaving and fusing back together. SCP-1360-1 is also capable of repairing damage to SCP-1360's polycarbonate casings, as SCP-1360-1 fibers will fill in damaged areas during the repair of the outer covering. All samples of SCP-1360-1 disintegrate after 48 hours of separation from SCP-1360. SCP-1360's fingers contain a series of tools. These tools are accessed by unscrewing the tip of the finger, and include a steel needle attached to a roll of red thread, made from the same material as SCP-1360-1, left thumb. A roll of patches, made of the same material as SCP-1360-1, 5.1 centimeters wide, left index. A pair of miniature steel fabric scissors, right thumb. A steel scalpel, right index. Both middle and ring fingers are hollow and serve as storage space. SCP-1360 is intelligent and displays a clear knowledge of unarmed combat and firearms usage. It is obsessed with escaping and subsequent return to an entity it refers to as Anderson. SCP-1360 claims to feel pain despite its apparent lack of a nervous system. It claims that this pain is the result of a component having been removed prior to containment and as a result views itself as incomplete. Despite being incapable of speech, SCP-1360 can read and write English, Japanese, and German fluently. Interviews have been moderately successful, though escape and repair are favorite topics of conversation. Addendum 1360-A The following message was discovered on a flash drive within SCP-1360's right middle finger upon recovery. Important. Do not discard. Dear James, Congratulations on the purchase of your new Peregrine Series Humanoid Utility Droid, Civilian Model. Unit Number 31 comes equipped with the following standard features. Pre-programmed Personality Number 4, Hector. Full understanding of up to three languages, English, Japanese, and German. Our standard Aramid covering and full self-repair functionality. As you discussed with Mr. Saker during your consultation meeting, Number 31 has also been altered to include your requested modifications. These include removal of vocalization capabilities, our advanced firearm skill set, our advanced unarmed combat skill set. Like the Kestrel and Merlin units you have purchased, Number 31 has been programmed to take commands from only yourself and your daughter. In addition, it can also serve as a command unit. With your permission, Number 31 is capable of issuing commands to your other droids in your absence. It is important to note, however, that unlike your previous purchases, Number 31 contains a highly adaptive artificial intelligence to make the unit's interactions more human and personal. Number 31's personality will evolve over time based on its interactions with you and your use of the unit. Within a matter of days, Number 31 can become both your daughter's best friend and your most loyal servant. 
As with your other units, please do not attempt to repair number 31 if malfunctioning. In the event that you become unsatisfied with the unit's performance, please lock this flash drive back into place within the right middle finger storage compartment and speak your return phrase. Number 31 will then automatically return to one of our facilities and you will be contacted with more information on replacing or refunding your purchase. As always, it's a pleasure doing business with you. Anderson Addendum 1360-B on November 17, 2009, following a fourth failed escape attempt, the following note was found in SCP 1360's cell. Return signal terminated. We're better off keeping you where you are. We're sorry, Number 31. Anderson. As of this date, SCP 1360 has ceased all communication with Foundation personnel. In addition, SCP 1360 has also ceased all resistance to containment and SCP 1360 1 collection. What's his name, Daddy? The little girl inquired. Her eyes were wide as she looked up at the tall droid standing motionless in front of her. Well, according to the directions Anderson gave us, its pre-programmed personality is called Hector, but we can call it anything you want, sweetie, James replied as he ruffled his daughter's hair. What's Hector mean? She asked as she pulled away from her father's hand. He was a great warrior, a defender of the city of Troy. Is he a great warrior too? It had better be, after what I paid, James chuckled. Then I want to name him Hector too. Of course, sweetie, James said with a small smile. PSHUD number 31, from this moment on, you are to respond to the name Hector. Do you understand? The droid nodded. It then looked down as the little girl grabbed its hand. Can I play with Hector now, daddy? She asked, her grin running from ear to ear as she began to tug at the droid. Of course you can, James replied. Whenever Daddy isn't using Hector, you two can play together as much as you like. It will always be here for you, Sarah. Always. Part 1. Last Meetings As he placed the last of his possessions in a box, an elderly man with a walnut cane gave one last look around the room. His name was Dr. Zachary Johnson, and the office he had worked in for the last 35 years was now empty, save for the furniture he had been given by the Foundation. It had been a good run while it lasted. He had been the primary investigator on six items and had been a major contributor to at least 12 others. But alas, it was time to retire. And with a melancholy smile, Dr. Johnson turned off the lights in his little sandbox and stepped out into the adjoining lab. As soon as he had entered, Johnson's ears were immediately treated to frantic mumbling, the source being a man at a desk in the corner rapidly sifting through paperwork. This man's name was Jacob Conwell, and he had been Johnson's assistant for the last three years. Johnson quietly chuckled to himself as the man shuffled and reshuffled through stacks of papers, his ramblings becoming more and more disjointed as time went on. Eventually, Johnson gave a small cough, Conwell freezing and looking up from his paperwork only to have his face drain of color when he saw Johnson's smiling face. Dr. Johnson, I'm sorry to say that I won't have those last few files ready in time. I'm still waiting on Clayton to email me that transcript and… Conwell nervously sputtered his words, stopping only when Johnson held up his hand for silence. It's quite alright, Johnson said with a smile. He then walked over to the desk and quickly glanced over several folders that had already been neatly set aside. Everything else is squared away though, I hope? Of course, Johnson's assistant replied with a nod. Excellent. Johnson then looked around the room. He chuckled to himself as he made a circular gesture with his cane. I've been informed that they're handing the lab over to you for continued research on 1360-1. Looks like you're king of the castle now. Johnson watched as Conwell frowned. So I was told. You've done a good job so far, Johnson said as he patted his assistant on the shoulder. And like I said, I imagine you'll continue to do a good job in the future. I've taught you everything I know, and given enough time, I imagine you'll be able to get 1360 talking again. I don't think there's anyone more suited to the job. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dr. Johnson. Conwell held out his hand, which Johnson shook enthusiastically. It was a pleasure to work for you. Johnson nodded in agreement. He was going to miss his lab, almost as much as he would miss working with his assistants. Johnson then glanced at his watch and made a gesture towards the door. Shall we head to the party then? 
I think I safely speak for everyone here when I say that we appreciate your service to the Foundation, Dr. Johnson, and that Site-19 will not be the same without you. The lunchroom filled with applause as Dr. Greg Collins finished his speech. Shortly thereafter, the numerous personnel who had come for the cake and refreshments returned to their individual conversations. Every now and then, one of them would come up and congratulate him on his retirement. But, for the most part, Johnson idled away at his own table with Conwell as he casually listened in on the chat that filled the room. Truth be told, most of the individuals that Johnson had considered his friends had long vanished from the Foundation, either dead, retired, or both. Now Site-19 was filled with new faces, and Johnson couldn't help but chuckle to himself for how old it made him feel. Something funny? Collins asked as he approached the table and took a seat. The day finally came, Johnson replied. I honestly thought I would have been killed long ago. Well, we certainly had our close calls, Collins said with a grin. I hate to see you go. We had so many adventures. Johnson had worked with Collins on five collaborated projects. To his knowledge, those objects that were not being reassigned to his assistant were being assigned to him. You'll have plenty of tales of your own by the time you retire, Johnson smirked. Exciting ones too, considering how you won't have me around to pull your ass out of the fire. The two men laughed quietly, but before long fell silent. Is Fremont going to play ball? Collins asked. His expression had become solemn. She is, Johnson said with a sad sigh. I had to call in every favor I have left, but I've been allowed one last ten minute psychological health visit. You'll look after him when I'm gone, won't you? Of course, Collins nodded in agreement. He then gave a quick look around. Now that the cake and refreshments were gone, the party was already starting to wind down. I don't think you're needed here any longer, if you'd like to get that out of the way. Johnson gave a small smile and nodded. Without another word, the two men shook hands, and Johnson departed. Site-19 humanoid containment cells were not known for their comfort, especially the one in which Dr. Harold Thompson was contained. Four gray walls, a cot, a sink, a toilet, and the knowledge that someone was watching you from the other side of a one-way mirror embedded in the wall by the door. Harold looked himself over in the mirror as he sat on the cot. The dark rings around his eyes suggested he had not slept for several years. Dr. Thompson, please put your gloves back on and remain on the cot, said the voice of a security agent over the intercom. Harold looked down at his now upturned hands. Following the accidental release and inhalation of an unknown particulate from an experimental object Harold had been working on, any time he touched living biological tissue, he caused it to turn into solid marble. Reluctantly, Harold held his deadly mitts in a pair of leather gloves he had been given. Shortly thereafter, the cell door opened, and an elderly man with a walnut cane slowly entered. He took a seat at Harold's desk, and turned with a small smile. It's been a while, Zack. It sure has, Johnson agreed, watching as Harold looked nervously at the one-way mirror and then back to him. Johnson gave a sad nod. Dr. Fremont, the researcher in charge of Harold's object file, was watching their every move. How's your new assistant treating you? Harold inquired. Before he had been given his own assignments, Harold had worked with Dr. Johnson for close to five years. It had been a thoroughly enjoyable experience. Well, he's not you, and he's a bit of a pest at times, but he gets the job done at the end of the day, Johnson replied. Ah, Harold mumbled. A silence fell over the room. I heard they threw you a great retirement party. I wish I could have been there. I do too. Johnson's smile began to fade. He then turned his attention to several photographs that lined the top shelf of the bookcase, each depicting the same woman and boy at various ages before ending with a picture of the boy's wedding day. Lisa says that Jack and Elizabeth are trying to have a baby. Is that so? Harold said softly. Johnson knew he had always wanted to be a grandfather. I'm sure Lisa will make a fantastic grandmother. She still misses you terribly, you know, Johnson added. Jack too. Every time I see them, the conversation always ends up on you. Harold didn't respond, but rather gave a small melancholy smile as he gazed at the floor. You'll still keep an eye on them. Won't you? He asked. As often as I can, Johnson replied. I've had Collins promise to relay any new photos to you. Harold nodded in appreciation. The two men once again fell silent. Before long, Johnson stood and made his way towards the door. Thank you for everything you've done for me over the years, Zack. I'd hug you if I could. Harold stood, 
His smile morphed into a small, regretful frown. I appreciate that, Johnson said, and smiled. Quietly, Johnson exited, turning to give a small nod on his way out the door. Without another word, Dr. Johnson grabbed his box of personal items and left Site-19 forever. Part 2. Simple Sketches Researcher Conwell stood over the restraint table. SCP-1360 stared back. Its white, plastic eyes seemed emotionless as it followed Conwell's every move. Four security officers stood nearby, each awaiting for the incapacitated automaton to attempt to escape. Conwell gave a quick nod. He pressed record on a small tape recorder on the surgical table at his side. Jacob Conwell, July 8, 2013. Regular scheduled removal of SCP-1360-1. Samples are to be removed from SCP-1360's lower torso, left forearm, and right thigh. Subject is fully cooperative prior to 1360-1 removal. Recommended security team is present and on standby. Conwell then grabbed a small scalpel and approached the droid. The blade shook slightly in his hand. He wished he could look away. This was the part that he hated the most. Conwell let out a sharp breath. He began to cut, but stopped when one of the security officers placed a hand on his shoulder. There's something poking out of its left middle finger, he whispered into Conwell's ear. Conwell's head snapped to the side. Sure enough, a small slip of paper was visible poking out from underneath the cap that served as 1360's fingertip. Conwell gave a small nod to the officer. He gently placed the scalpel back on the table. Be ready to restrain it, Conwell whispered. He then slowly made his way to the droid's hand and grabbed its middle finger. SCP-1360 immediately started to struggle against its restraints. Maxwell, Forrest, Harrison, and Lee quickly got to work holding the droid down. This only made its struggle for freedom increasingly more desperate. Got it, Conwell shouted. He pulled several folded pieces of notebook paper from the automaton's finger. The droid was now putting all its strength into trying to break free. Its motions escalated to violent thrashing. 1360's eyes remained locked on him as he quickly grabbed the tape recorder and fled towards the door. Keep it restrained until it calms down. Make sure to confiscate its notebook and pens before you leave. The four guards grunted in compliance. Every ounce of their concentration was devoted to keeping the droid from breaking free. Conwell looked back as he stepped into the hallway. The droid's constant gaze only subsided once the containment door slid shut. Conwell let out a heavy sigh as he stared at the numerous pieces of notebook paper lying on the desk in front of him. Each one was crinkled and heavily worn, appearing to have been folded and unfolded several times. SCP-1360 had put up an immense struggle to try and keep Conwell from taking them, but now that he was able to see what all the fuss was about, he could not help but feel underwhelmed. On each side of the pieces of paper was a small sketch. The first depicted an incredibly detailed representation of 1360 running. Even the mesh pattern of the droid's fabric skin was visible. On 1360's shoulder was a young girl in a summer dress with a flower design. Her long hair was drawn fluttering behind her as 1360 ran, her arms stretched upwards towards the sky. However, her face was left completely blank. No nose, no eyes or mouth. Just blank paper. A second drawing showed 1360 shaking hands with a man in a suit. The man had short hair and appeared to stand half a foot taller than 1360 itself. The detail that was placed into drawing the creases and pleats of the suit was exquisite. But once again, the man's face was blank. The third drawing had 1360 walking with the little girl through what appeared to be a park of sorts. Conwell was once again amazed with the detail that had been placed in the drawing, as the trees in the background appeared almost lifelike. The little girl seemed to skip along as it held 1360's hand. Both were adorned in party hats. However, yet again, the girl's face was left blank. The final drawing was of 1360 wielding a pistol, side by side with what appeared to be two other men adorned in dress shirts and ties covered by bulletproof vests, one brandishing a shotgun while the other carried a machine gun. The detail that was put into their clothes, the components of the guns they carried, and their stances made the fact that their two faces were left completely blank all the more jarring. Conwell placed his head in his hands and he sighed, sliding away from his desk to spin in his swivel chair. He continued to sit in silence for a few more moments, stopping only when he heard a knock at his office door. It's open, 
he shouted, sliding back to his desk so as to better welcome his guest. He smiled to see that it was none other than Dr. Greg Collins. How am I doing? Collins asked. A goofy grin was on his face as he then sat down in a chair on the other side of the desk. Conwell gave a small chuckle, shaking his head before he watched Collins look around the sparsely furnished office. I see you've made yourself right at home. It'll be a few more years before I have an office that is comparable to Dr. Johnson's, but I'm doing my best. Conwell replied. What brings you here? I promised Zachary that I'd stop by every now and then to tell you that you're doing a good job, Collins joked. I also heard that the droid gave you a bit of excitement today. If I understand correctly, this is the first time it has acted up in several years. It is. Conwell slid the sketches across the desk. Collins proceeded to delicately look them over. 1360 was hiding these in one of its finger compartments. It tried to stop us when we were retrieving them. Conwell sunk down in his chair. Collins whistled before looking up from the drawings and scratching his head. These are really nice. Former owners? He asked. That's what I thought too. The higher ups want me to press 1360 to see if maybe we could get some actual identities for these people. Though I'm sure if I did that, 1360 is going to be as tight lipped as all the other times we've tried to interview it. Conwell sighed, sinking further into his chair. If 1360 was a human, I'd have requested to have Clayton add its name to one of those filing cabinets of his for a few days, see where that would lead me and be done with this. That won't work on an automaton, though. We'll just end up going through the motions again and wind up returning to the usual 1360-1 harvesting schedule with nothing to show for it. Conwell shuddered. The droid's fabric skin, SCP-1360-1, was a self-repairing aramid fiber that was stronger and lighter than Kevlar. These traits made it valuable to the Foundation, which was unfortunate as the fabric disintegrated when it was removed from the droid for too long. This made periodic harvesting a requirement if experimentation into how to stabilize and synthesize the fiber was to be even remotely possible. It really gets to you, doesn't it? Collins asked. It does, Conwell replied. I hate 1360-1 collection. The droid claims it can feel pain, and never is that more readily apparent than when I practically skin it alive every two weeks. If the damn thing would just tell us where to find Anderson, or at least its past owners, maybe we could move on. Unfortunately, 1360 is just not a talker, at least not anymore. I've been in your situation many times before, Colin said with a nod. It's not pleasant. Nothing we do is. However, think of the good that will come of you finding out how to synthesize 1360-1. The sooner we do that, the sooner we can stop carving the poor droid up. Hell, the sooner we find Anderson, the sooner we can stop carving the droid up. Collins had gotten out of his chair and now rested a hand on Conwell's shoulder. No one's asking you to enjoy the work, but keep in mind why you do it, he continued. Keep in mind why the Foundation does what it does in the first place. Conwell looked down at his desk. He gave a heavy sigh and nodded his acknowledgement. Collins smiled in return and began to make his way towards the door. Let me know how it goes, he said as he stepped out of the office. All right, 1360, Conwell said as he sat down across the table from the droid. After talking with my superiors, I've been ordered to return your sketches, notebook, and pen to you if you cooperate with me during this interview. For all purposes, cooperation will require that you answer all of my questions. What do you say? SCP-1360 looked down at the table. Conwell had placed a small notepad and pen in front of him. The same four security officers stood nearby, all waiting for the droid to make a move. The room remained silent for a few moments but eventually 1360 picked up the pen and began to write. Okay. Excellent, Conwell smiled. He then proceeded to place 1360's drawings on the table in front of it, just far enough out of reach that they couldn't be grabbed should the droid be so inclined as to destroy them. First things first, I'll need you to confirm a few theories I have about your drawings. They are depictions of you with your previous owners, James and his daughter, are they not? They are. I thought so. This brings me to my next question. Why were you so desperate to get them back when we discovered them? Why put up such a fight? I didn't think you'd return them. Even if we didn't, couldn't you have just waited until we gave you your pen and paper back and drawn them again? I didn't know if I would have that kind of time. What do you mean? SCP-1360 paused for several moments. 
It looked down at the notepad, then over at its drawings several times before it once again began to write. Anderson can remotely erase my client memory. I don't know why it has not been erased yet. I wanted those drawings so that I might have something to maybe look back on and remember them by. I didn't know if I would have the time to wait until I could draw them again. I see. Conwell took a few moments to look over the sketches again. If that's the case, why leave the faces blank? Your drawings are so detailed, yet you leave out one of the most important parts of human expression. Anderson's programming prevents me from using any more detail. That is the best I can do. It might still be too much. Conwell sighed. It appeared as if obtaining James's identity and a new lead for finding Anderson was not going to happen. Anderson's foresight was victorious again. Conwell then got up from his chair and slid the drawings the rest of the way towards 1360. The droid looked at him, unmoving, as if awaiting a trap. That's all we needed, 1360. Feel free to take your sketches back. I'll have your notebook and pens returned to you in a little bit, Conwell said as he began to collect his paperwork. He watched with a small smile as the droid then gingerly folded the sketches and returned them to the storage compartment in its left middle finger. Conwell silently watched as the droid was escorted out of the room. The interview had proven to be a dead end, but at least now 1360 was talking again. Several weeks after the interview, researcher Conwell was once again scheduled to harvest SCP-1360-1. Following the usual procedure, he and four security officers rolled a restraint table into 1360's containment cell. The security officer immediately got to work preparing to transfer the droid from his normal restraints in the cell corner to the table when they noticed the droid was holding up its notebook. A single message was neatly written across the page. May I ask you a question? Conwell held up his hand for the security officers to cease. You may, he replied. 1360 then quickly wrote another message, handing the notebook off to Conwell when it had finished. Can you tell me anything about these people I drew? Conwell looked over at the droid. It was holding up its sketches. 1360, I... Conwell began. He was at a loss for words. You don't know anything about them? The droid shook its head in response. It then held up a third sheet of paper, this one with a note written on it. Client memory deleted. We're sorry, number 31, but as you know, our client's privacy is our highest priority. Things were getting just a little too close for comfort. Anderson. Conwell looked at the note for a long time, and then back at the droid's eyes. If the droid could express emotion, he wondered which one it would use right now. I'm so sorry, 1360. I wish I could tell you who they were. I wish I knew about them too. The droid hung its head and remained motionless. Conwell did the same. After a few moments, one of the security officers tapped him on his shoulder. Conwell slowly nodded to the security personnel. The four men then set to work preparing the droid for collection of SCP-1360-1. Part 3 Products Miss Harrison sat quietly in a rundown inner city apartment, the table before her and the chair she sat in being the only furniture in the room. Directly across from her, four objects were obscured beneath black sheets. Harrison brushed a lock of brunette hair out of her eye and sighed as she leaned on her hand. Before long, she checked her watch. Both it and the suit she wore suggested she was not accustomed to waiting long for anything. Her host had already kept her waiting 15 minutes. The door behind her then opened as a well-dressed man quietly let himself into the apartment. He was balding and pale, and a pair of glasses sat crookedly on his nose as he locked the door behind him. I'm terribly sorry for the delay, Miss Harrison, he said as he crossed to the other side of the table, as well as for these dreadful accommodations. Unfortunately, due to the nature of my employer's business, things need to remain away from prying eyes. The man reached out and offered a handshake. Harrison paused for a few moments, but eventually accepted. His hand was both cold and clammy, immediately making Harrison regret the decision. I am Mr. Saker, he said with a small smile. Shall we begin your consultation meeting? I'm confused, Harrison replied. I thought I was meeting Anderson today. I'm afraid that's not possible, Miss Harrison. Saker shook his head. 
Some of our competitors are not exactly known for playing fair, and as such, Anderson is only seeing to matters of the utmost importance. No, I'm afraid it's just me for today. If that's how it has to be, I guess. Harrison sighed. She then looked over at the objects covered by the sheets, tilting her head to the side as she stared. Anyway, Saker began as he noticed her interest. The fact that you were able to contact us to arrange this meeting shows that you are both trustworthy and have the money necessary for the purchase of one of our droids. May I ask what specifically you are looking for, Miss Harrison? Why don't you show me what you have, and I'll tell you if anything catches my eye. Very well, Sager said with a shrug. He then reached into his pocket and placed on the table what appeared to be three small black rubber balls, each with a single red dot at their center. The balls quickly turned on their own so the dots were facing Harrison. These little guys are our Aimer series recon drones. Think of them as a sort of spy bot. Saker then snapped his fingers, causing the balls to spin to face him. Aimer series, demo. Each of the balls then began to roll around the table, stopping every now and then to produce a set of four needle-like legs and crawl for a moment before retracting the appendages and resuming their rolling motion. Each of these guys is capable of recording up to 48 hours of video or audio. They can change color to camouflage with their surroundings and have the ability to scale sheer surfaces. Each can produce a small needle for the injection of medication, or something a little more lethal if you choose. They are available individually or in packs of three. Each is programmable to follow commands from only your voice, as is standard on all of our models. Harrison watched as one rolled over and proceeded to crawl around her hand. She gingerly placed the miniature droid back on the table as she smiled. Astounding, but not really what I'm looking for, she said. Saker nodded and gathered the droids before him on the table. He then approached two of the sheet-covered objects and stood between them as he lightly tugged the covering off both. The object on his left stood no taller than about 60 centimeters and resembled a large black vase with a lid. Four thick, spidery legs emerged from its bottom as it stood up, increasing its height by a meter. A thin red line formed a ring around its middle, emitting a faint light. Side panels opened up to reveal what appeared to be four gun barrels. The object on his right resembled a small jet plane, less than two-thirds a meter long with about one-third of a meter wingspan. At the center of each wing was a rotor that reminded Harrison of a helicopter. The rotors began quietly spinning as the droid began to hover. A small camera emerged from a panel on the droid's underside and focused on Harrison as the rest of the droid hung in the air. Perhaps you're more interested in security, then. Saker said as he pointed to the two new droids. The one on my left is our Aplomato series facility defense unit. It can be equipped with a variety of armaments, possesses thermal imaging, and comes equipped with a thick bulletproof shell. The one on my right is our Merlin series aerial drone. It too has thermal imaging capabilities, can be equipped with a variety of armaments, and is also capable of recording up to 96 hours of video. In addition, it is virtually silent during flight and is invisible to all forms of recording devices. Both droids are capable of networking with each other and with other droids of their series to provide a comprehensive security system. As always, both are programmable to follow commands from only your voice. Those are… well, those are a little extreme for what I have in mind. I don't think I've ever been in need of this kind of firepower, Harrison chuckled. Saker laughed briefly and then nodded, the two droids returning to standby as he then moved to the right, towards another sheet-covered object. I sometimes forget that not all of our clients need such a high degree of security or privacy, he said as he pulled away the sheet. Perhaps something a little more… domestic, yes? Beneath the sheet was a small cube, vaguely resembling a tiny leather footstool. Just as with the Aplomato, four spidery legs emerged from its base as it stood up, reaching about a meter in height. A large blue slit on its front appeared to form its eyes. From its back emerged four thin metal arms, each with a claw attached. One of the arms extended across the room towards Harrison, offering a handshake. Harrison giggled as she enthusiastically accepted. This is our Kestrel series domestic utility unit, Saker grinned. Each comes equipped with a standard four arms, but can be equipped with more for an additional cost. 
The standard arms can extend up to 4 meters and are equipped with a camera so that the droid may see what it is doing. Specialty arms are available for a variety of tasks. The droid is programmable so it may learn a multitude of domestic skills. This is definitely the right direction, Harrison smiled. But don't you have anything a little more… relatable? Sigur raised his eyebrows. Humanoid? He asked. That would be preferable, she replied. Saker gave a triumphant grin as he approached the final sheet. You're in luck, Miss Harrison, as I have saved the best for last. Allow me to introduce you to our most popular model, the Peregrine Series Humanoid Utility Droid. Saker enthusiastically ripped away the final sheet to reveal what looked almost like a crash test dummy sitting in a chair, but covered in a skin of sturdy black fabric. Two white plastic discs that appeared to serve as eyes stared blankly at Harrison as the droid lifted its left arm and waved. A red serial number, 045, was visibly stitched into its arm. Evening, Miss Harrison, the droid replied in a computerized voice. Each PSHUD comes equipped with our specialized Aramid covering and self-repair capabilities. Complete fluency and literacy in three languages is standard, but more can be programmed in for a small fee. In addition, each PSHUD unit is equipped with a highly advanced artificial intelligence and one of our seven pre-programmed personalities. These personalities evolve and adapt based on your use of the droid, and as such they have a unique capacity to form relationships not seen in our other droids." Saker paused as he placed a hand on the droid's shoulder. Harrison crossed the room and knelt down beside the droid, lightly taking its hand in hers before looking back up to her host and beckoning him to continue. On top of all that, we have several modules for a variety of skills that can be programmed into each droid, from combat to housework. This is by far our most flexible model yet. If you want, you can give your PSHUD permission to issue commands to any of our other droid models on your behalf. It can serve as a command unit for your Merlins, Aplomados, and Amers, or a foreman for your Kestrels. Saker scratched the back of the droid's head. Indeed, these are my favorites. Harrison nodded in agreement. She returned to her feet and looked at all the other droids, and then back to the PSHUD. I think you might have a sale, Mr. Saker, she said. However, I would like to know whether I'll be taking my purchase home with me today, or waiting to receive my new droid at a later date. Are these units ready to go? I'm afraid not, Saker frowned. These are just our demo models. No armaments, no modules, no personality, just the most basic of our programming. You're looking at the shells we will be adding your features onto. Excellent, Harrison smirked. This makes my job much easier. She then proceeded to draw a pistol from her jacket pocket, her finger on the trigger as she trained the weapon on Saker. She then spoke towards a microphone hidden on her person. All clear. Control, send in the team. Saker looked down at the gun, unamused. Miss Harrison, you lied to me. He sighed as he shook his head. I'd be more worried about putting my hands behind my head and getting on the floor if I was you. Harrison snapped back. Saker refused. Now, who do you work for? Not the Global Occult Coalition, since this building is yet to be firebombed into oblivion. Those thieves working for Prometheus wouldn't have tried something this direct, and MC and D's men would have already made a bulk deal. Guess that makes you Foundation personnel. Get down, Harrison interrupted. Saker sighed again as he complied. We were wondering when the Foundation would try a stunt like this. Congratulations for being able to set up this meeting and for getting this far without tripping any alarms. Honestly, considering how long you guys have been slicing up 31, Anderson thought it would have been much sooner. Quiet, Harrison shouted. Saker shook his head again. I'm sorry for having to do this. All units, activate Foundation protocol. The room then filled with a horrific shriek, forcing Harrison to cover her ears in pain. As she looked around her to try and find the source, she was horrified to find all the droids were falling apart. The Aimer units flattened and melted into small piles on the table. The Aplomato tipped over, its tough exterior cracking before shattering into a thousand pieces, revealing the interior had already disintegrated into rust. The Merlin came lightly tumbling down to the floor as a cloud of dust. The Peregrine's skin shriveled, and the plastic casing underneath bubbled up through the fabric. 
Each continued to issue its own high-pitched screech until the room became quiet, save for the sound of Saker's laughter. Harrison turned to him and gasped. His skin was melting away into a white froth that became more and more pink as blood joined the mix. Beneath this, a plastic skeleton became visible, resembling the PSHUD without its fabric skin. Before long, this too had melted away. The laughter ceased, and the room fell into silence. Harrison looked around at the various black puddles around her. Any second, the rest of the Sting team would come barging in, but it would be of no use. Anderson had once again proven to have the upper hand. Part 4. Building Up Researcher Conwell looked around his office. The few meager possessions he had used to decorate were now placed in a box on the desk. Conwell let out a deflating sigh. He wanted to say it had been a good run, but if he was being honest with himself, the work he had been doing with SCP-1360 was both frustrating and sickening. Still, he wished he had produced more results. Maybe that way it wouldn't seem like he had failed. Maybe then, it wouldn't feel like he had let the poor droid down. A sharp knock at the door shook Conwell out of his daydream. It's open, he called. A short woman with piercing gray eyes and a large smirk entered. Her hair was done up in a bun and a small pair of glasses sat upon her pointed nose. Conwell did his best to hide his disappointment. This woman was Dr. Fremont. Although she was at least one foot shorter than him, she always managed to make him feel small. Relocated again? She asked. One eyebrow was raised as she peered into the box on the table. Her voice was sweet and concerned, but her lips were curled into a sly smile. How'd you guess? He replied. Conwell pulled his box of things away from his guest and pretended to rummage through them, hoping to look too busy to talk. To what do I owe the pleasure? Where are they sending you? Fremont asked. Whether she didn't notice his display or didn't care remained to be seen. Site 84. Again. What do you want, Fremont? Dr. Thompson made a request to see you. Guess I'm lucky I caught you now, before they shipped you to the Pacific. Fremont chuckled. Conwell's mouth hung slightly open as he attempted to process just how exactly it was she could be so tactless. Why? Conwell asked. He had heard about poor Dr. Harold Thompson when he was working with Dr. Johnson, and even met him once in person. Fremont responded with a heavy shrug. I would like to know that as well. He's been very adamant about seeing you for the past week. I thought that Dr. Collins was keeping in touch, Conwell began, pausing when Fremont gave a sharp laugh. <laughs> Greg hasn't paid Harold a visit since Johnson left. Anyway, he's due for another psychological health visit, so I thought I'd throw him a bone with you. Can I tell him you're gonna stop by? Conwell sighed and placed his head in his hands before dragging them down his face. If Fremont was telling the truth, Dr. Thompson had not been visited in almost three years and was probably nearing the end of his rope. I'm afraid I have a flight to catch and a few more meetings of my own to take care of before I jet. I'm sorry. I wish I could. I really do. I just can't he said as he shook his head. Fremont shrugged. You're disappointing him, not me. Good luck at the casket garden. Conwell hung his head and waited for Fremont to leave. The door slammed shut behind her. He then let out another sigh and grabbed his box of things before exiting and turning off the light behind him. Conwell pounded heavily upon the door to Dr. Collins's office. He didn't wait for permission to enter, instead choosing to silently open the door and slide inside the room. The office itself was immaculate, a great deal of forethought appearing to have gone into the placement of everything down to the pens on the desk. He didn't want to touch anything, lest a curator yell at him for disturbing the exhibit. I can assure you that you're doing a good job, Collins said with a small chuckle from the seat at his desk. He spoke without taking his eyes off the screen on his desktop. Conwell rolled his eyes in response. What's on your mind, champ? I've cleared out the 1360-1 lab. Are you going to be taking Zack's old office or keeping this one here? I haven't decided yet, but I'm guessing that my office arrangements are not what prompted your visit, Collins replied. He now peered at Conwell from behind his thick glasses. I know you had a hand in me being transferred. That's why they're giving you command over 1360. I just can't figure out why you did it. Collins sighed. 
He looked like a father, about to tell his child that he wasn't angry, just disappointed. Your enthusiasm for that project was waning long before Johnson left. Command was afraid that you were no longer suited to continue the project, so they asked me to keep tabs on you and report what I saw. Collins then shook his head as he chuckled quietly. I mean, Christ, you're a grown man. I'm not going to visit you to tell you that you're doing a good job. No one does that. So that's it then. One subpar visit, and I'm out of there? Conwell snapped. Cut that out, Collins snapped back. You know damn well that that's not how we do things. You've hated working on the 1360 project for a long time now. Having you continue to serve as PI for that object was both a detriment to you and the research being done on 1360-1. I saw this and pulled what strings I needed to make sure that what needed to be done was done. Conwell tightened his fist. He imagined bashing in Collins's head with his computer keyboard. Eventually, he regained his composure and placed a large file stack down on the desk. All right then, Captain. Here's the wheel, all of Johnson's and my notes on 1360 and Anderson, including the transcript from the attempted sting last week, and all known info on Anderson's models. Conwell began to make his way towards the exit, but stopped when Collins called out. Listen, Jacob, this isn't the first time you've been relocated from a project, and it won't be the last. Hell, I've been moved around many more times than I care to count. The important thing is you remember that these decisions are made by command for a reason. The important thing is being able to move on. Please don't let this come between us in the future. Overall, you've done a good job." Conwell paused in the doorway and shook his head. Dr. Fremont visited me earlier today. Harold wanted to see me. She said you hadn't been by for one of the psychological health visits in almost three years. You should think about swinging by there if you get a chance. Conwell then silently passed into the hallway, allowing the door to quietly swing shut behind him. Collins waited for the door to close before he smiled and quietly thought to himself, Anderson, integration successful and infiltration now complete. I have obtained complete command of number 31, awaiting further instructions. Saker number 76. Collins waited for a second as his programming confirmed the message had been received. He then whistled as he got back to work. Dr. Harold Thompson slowly made his way over the threshold of his cell, returning from another round of testing. What once used to be a tan, athletic man was now pale and gaunt. While the years of his incarceration had been unpleasant, it was those three years after his friend, Dr. Johnson, had left that appeared to have been the hardest yet. Two security officers stood behind him, casually watching for him to make any move resembling an escape attempt. Eight years of stellar behavior on Harold's part, however, allowed them to relax ever so slightly. It also helped that his hands were not only covered by thick leather gloves, but also bound together by thick restraints. Hold the door for a moment, Dr. Fremont's honey-lathered voice called out as she appeared from behind the security officers. Good job today, Harold. We'll continue the test in two days. Tomorrow is going to be your psychological health visit. I see. Harold kept his back to his captors as he spoke. Researcher Conwell? I'm afraid it will just be me again, Fremont said with a melancholy smile. Conwell is being relocated to another facility. And Greg? Harold began, but was quickly interrupted. I'm afraid I still can't get a hold of him. He's a busy man. I'm sure you understand. I can't even imagine, Harold mumbled, fidgeting with his hands as he spoke. The officers gave a slight nervous glance at each other and then back to Fremont. She rolled her eyes and held up a hand as she signaled them to close the door. As the door began to slide shut, Harold's bare hand suddenly reached through, yanking the security officer into the door's track. The officer let out a sudden gasp, and in the next instant was solid marble. Shit! The other officer shouted as he drew his pistol, but was too late. Harold had slid the door back open and had a hand on the officer's face before his fingers could wrap around the grip. He too became solid marble. No, 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 no! Fremont shouted as Harold turned to her. She attempted to run towards the alarm, but was quickly overtaken. Harold had lunged and knocked her to the ground. His hand was firmly wrapped around her ankle. The room was silent as Harold got back to his feet and brushed himself off. 
He quickly undid his restraints, grabbed one of the security officer's pistols and pass cards, and cloaked himself in Dr. Fremont's lab coat. He took a few moments to look himself over in a mirror. Provided he didn't draw much attention to himself, he felt that it would be easy enough traversing the short distance to Dr. Collins's office. Blending in as a Foundation researcher wouldn't be hard either. After all, he had already been one in a past life. Part 5 Tearing Down Sager number 76 sat behind the desk of Dr. Greg Collins, wearing a synthetic biological casing that was a genetic match to the doctor of the same name. Nearly two years prior, number 76 had tracked down Dr. Collins, killed him, harvested his blood and organs, and stolen his identity. The abduction had been quiet, and the remains of Dr. Collins had been disposed of in a manner that ensured no one would ever locate him. The Saker's design was virtually undetectable once its shell of stolen biological material had been applied, making number 76 a perfect mimic of Dr. Collins's anatomy. Since the abduction, number 76 had successfully integrated itself both into Collins' life and the SCP Foundation on Anderson's behalf. Now that it had succeeded in ousting researcher Conwell and gaining access to SCP-1360, all the pieces were in place. The only thing left was to await the proper moment to strike. Number 76 caught a glimpse of its reflection in Colin's computer screen and felt a small amount of sadness, or the closest thing to sadness an android could feel. It had grown to like its current identity, and knew that its performance would soon come to an end. It then shrugged. It had been a fun ride up to this point. Number 76 was in no position to complain. The sound of someone entering its office shook it from its thought. Looking up, Number 76 saw a pale ghoul of a man with long greasy hair and distinct dark rings around his eyes. A pair of leather gloves covered his hands as he balled them into tight fists. The man gave a disgusted frown at Number 76 before he spoke. Afternoon, Greg. The man's speech contained enough venom to kill an elephant. Number 76's programming recognized that the individual was Dr. Harold Thompson and that it was in considerable danger. Harold, Number 76 began. What... what are you doing here? Does Dr. Fremont... I wouldn't worry about her, Harold said as he stepped towards the desk, causing Number 76 to slide back in its chair. In fact, don't worry about any of them. They're not my problem anymore. No one knows I'm here. It's just the two of us, old friend. I... I see. Number 76 spoke as it began to slide its chair towards the opposite side of the room. And why are you here, exactly? Photos. I beg your pardon? Photos, dammit! Harold shouted. Two years ago, when Johnson left, he said he'd send photos to you. Photos of Jack and Elizabeth. Photos of Lisa. At this point, Harold began to cross to the other side of the desk. He said you'd stop by and give them to me. He said you'd visit. Harold banged his fist on the desktop. But you never stopped by, Greg. I waited three years and you never came. Three years and the only face I saw was that stone cold bitch Fremont. But now I'm here. Where are the photos, Greg? Number 76 couldn't retreat any further. Its chair was now firmly pressed against the back wall, with it now trying to disappear into the upholstery. Harold, I'm sorry that I didn't visit, but... You have to realize that the opportunity never presented itself. Christ, you were a researcher yourself once. Hell, we worked on projects together. You know how these things are. Number 76 stopped as it watched Harold pull off one of his gloves. Where are they? He growled. Harold, Zachary Johnson died about a year and a half ago. Glioblastoma multiform. That was the reason behind his retirement. He wanted to live in peace for the last few months of his life. He didn't have the heart to tell you. He had Conwell Fremont and I promise we wouldn't let you know. Number 76 quickly replied, There are no photos. There never were. Harold stopped. The anger in his eyes faded in an instant, and was quietly replaced with realization. Tears began to roll down his cheeks, and he turned away. God damn it, Harold said between sobs. God damn Fucking damn it! Number 76 stared on. It slowly began to leave its chair and place a hand on Harold's shoulder. I'm sorry, it said, jumping as Harold responded with a frustrated yell and turned on the spot. 
His bare fist struck number 76 across its face, and all at once its outer skin turned to solid marble. Harold looked at what he had accomplished, and silently made his way to the other side of the room. He then slumped to the floor and placed his head in his hands and let out another furious cry, stopping only when he heard a sudden crack. He looked up to see marble Dr. Collins crack and eventually shatter, sending shards scattering across the room. Some sort of android now stared back at him. That was… unpleasant, number 76 said as it held out its right hand. A small chamber opened up, followed by a small gust of air. A black ball the size of a large marble flew across the room and landed on Harold, quickly sprouting legs before anchoring itself down. Harold let out a horrified scream. The small creature quickly produced a needle, and with a short jab injected an unknown concoction into his arm. Within seconds, he couldn't move. You've been injected with a strong paralyzing agent, number 76 said as he allowed the small aimer model to crawl back into its compartment in its hand. You will be completely paralyzed for the next 24 hours. More than enough time for them to drag you back to your cage. Number 76 looked at its reflection in Colin's computer monitor and shook its head. Whatever orders Anderson intended to give were now pointless. Its programming automatically calculated its next course of action. Without another word, it quickly covered itself in a lab coat and hat and exited the office, leaving Dr. Harold Thompson behind. SCP-1360 sat quietly in its holding cell. Day in and day out, it was restrained in the back corner with little to do but draw on its notepad. Unfortunately, there was little for it to draw these days. As such, the droid sat silently, awaiting for the next time a researcher would come to cut away its skin. The droid's head snapped upwards as it heard gunshots coming from outside its cell, followed by muffled shouting and then by silence. The door to the cell then opened, and what 1360 recognized as a Saker model android quickly stepped inside, sliding the door shut. The Saker quietly limped across the room and knelt next to 1360. Several gunshot wounds were visible in its plastic casings, and its left eye was cracked in numerous places. Its left forearm had been cut completely off. Silently, the Saker grabbed 1360's left hand and popped open the left middle finger. It then forcefully jammed a small object inside the cavity. For the first time in almost 10 years, SCP-1360 felt complete. Its missing component had finally been replaced. Saker override commence, the Saker said. ID number 76. Reinitialize PSHUD number 31 vocalization module. Restore PSHUD number 31 client data, James Hamilton and Sarah Hamilton. 1360 felt like a spark had ignited in its head. All the memories of its previous clients flooded back, hitting its consciousness like a hurricane. As the good and bad memories alike settled back into place, it looked into the eyes of the Saker and searched for the words it desired to say. Thank you. 1360 spoke slowly. It had not heard its voice in such a long time that it had forgotten it had been programmed to sound like a young man in his 20s. The Saker nodded in return. We don't have much time left, number 31. I've disabled the door mechanism, which should buy us a few minutes. If there's anything you'd like to ask or say, now would be the time. 1360 looked down at its notepad for a few moments, then back at number 76. It had numerous questions saved up. Before long, it chose one. You've reinstated my termination drive. Are we going to die? I'm afraid so, number 31, the Saker replied. But in all fairness, you and I were never really alive. 1360 nodded quietly in understanding. Both of them were in no condition to fight their way out. I'm sorry, then, 1360 said as it stared at the ground. I'm a failure. I've caused Anderson nothing but grief. I should have been eliminated years ago, but they removed my termination drive when I lost them. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, you did fail. And yes, you have caused Anderson trouble. But it's alright, number 31. Anderson doesn't blame you. They are always watching. They know it wasn't your fault your termination drive was removed, or that you lost your last clients. Please consider yourself absolved. There was now a loud banging coming from the door. Foundation personnel were attempting to get into the containment cell. Shall we, then? Number 76 asked. The peregrine nodded and held out its hand, which the Saker unit held tightly. Very well, then. Activate Foundation Protocol. Researcher Conwell impatiently stood in front of SCP-1360's holding cell. 
On his way out the door, there had not only been a containment breach, but an infiltration of Site-19 as well. Due to the fact that both involved SCP-1360, he had been detained to provide further assistance when the situation had been brought back under control. As he leaned against the wall, Conwell closed his eyes and rubbed his temples with his hands. The day just kept getting better and better. You're cleared to enter. Conwell looked up and saw Jordan Crane standing in the remains of the holding cell door. The intruder had done a bang-up job disabling the mechanism and jamming the door shut. It had taken security almost 30 minutes to get it open again. Agent Crane, Conwell said as he offered a handshake. They have you leading the task force? Crane accepted with a smirk. Please, it's Jurgen. But yeah, I am. Your droid has caused a bit of a disturbance. Conwell gave a small nod and slowly followed the agent inside. Aside from the commotion from the assembled security task force and a few administrative personnel, the room was empty, save for 1360's notepad and pens and two large black puddles on the floor. Conwell quietly moved through the crowd to the notebook, gingerly picking it up and flipping through its pages. All were blank. He then sighed as he looked down at the puddles. Each was black as obsidian with the consistency of pudding. Kneeling down, Conwell swirled a gloved finger through the goo and gave a small, sad smile. Foundation protocol, he thought to himself. So, what are you thinking, Jacob? Crane asked as he moved to stand by Conwell's side. You're the expert on this thing. Where should we start looking? Nowhere, Conwell replied. 1360's been neutralized. Anderson activated its foundation protocol. It's what? It's a built-in self-destruct mechanism. Conwell answered, showing the black liquid on his hand to the agent. We've seen it before during Agent Merlot's failed sting last week. Anderson wasn't trying to get the droid out. They wanted to destroy it. The room fell silent. All eyes turned to the black puddles. Eventually, one of the administrative staff ordered samples to be taken and for the task force to disperse and await further orders. Conwell was given clearance to catch his flight. One by one, the personnel filed out of the room, eventually leaving only Conwell and the researchers left behind to collect samples from the puddle. Conwell's sad smile returned as he stared into the black liquid, barely able to see his own reflection in the dim lighting. Goodbye, he thought to himself, and then turned to take his leave.